Hello and assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. I'm Farhan Tahir and I am reaching you from Philadelphia. I am an internal medicine doctor and a rheumatologist. Today I am joined by my class fellow, Dr. Ghazala Nagra. She is an infection disease consultant from Texas. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ghazala, uh, Ghazala Nagra, for joining me uh, as an infection disease expert. Uh, and today we will uh, seek your expertise on coronavirus or COVID-19. Thank you so much, Farhan, for inviting me and the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Uh, so uh, please tell us a little bit about uh, what would you like to share with the Pakistani doctors community about uh, coronavirus? Okay, so uh, all the infectious disease and non-infectious disease around the globe, wherever my uh, fellow fellow doctors are working, there's some important tips that I want to share with you. Number one, that I am reading a lot of stuff from the media that lots of healthcare physicians, despite of wearing PPE, are getting infected. So why is that? So please, first of all, it's a, you know key to success how to properly wear PPE and to protect yourself. So you have to have a mask, fit mask test to see you are not using any size of mask. If your mask is not tightly fit, you are at high risk of getting infection. So watch videos. There's so many educational YouTube videos, they can teach you how to use these masks properly. And the majority of physicians get infected while you know, removing their PPE. You can self-contaminate yourself while you're removing your mask, your gown, your gloves, you are, you are at high risk of infecting yourself. So you have to be well equipped how to use these PPEs. And in a situation where you do not have any PPE, a very limited supply, that in our country usually we are facing this issue. So you can reuse your N95 mask. How? Just wear surgical mask on the top of N95 mask, and then keep you know disposing that surgical mask uh, from one room to another. Or maybe you can, if you have not enough supply, maybe every day. And that N95 mask, you can sterilize inside your home. Just wrap it in the tin foil and put it in the oven, 70 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes. So it will be enough to make it sterilized or reusable. Um, wow, thank you so much. This is totally new information uh, for me, at least. I have also found out that some uh, times the hospitals are asking us to keep these N95 in a uh, brown bag uh, yes. and use them in between the patients. Is that also another possibility? That, that can is be another done? possibility you can use that. You can do in between the patient. You can put in the brown bag and uh, there's less risk of getting contamination from the brown bag. And what about uh, eye protection? There is there is been okay. some some suggestions about that. So, so the main uh, route of transmission of this virus, or any kind of respiratory virus, is your mucous membrane. Anywhere you have mucous membrane, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and your hand are the main culprit. If you are touching the surfaces, or you are very close to the patient, even you are wearing the gloves, and the gloves are contaminated, and you are touching these areas you are at high risk of getting this virus. So make sure you wear uh, you know, goggles or face shield and then face masks, you are not able to touch your face, nose and eyes, you will be well protected. So we have to understand the mode of transmission. So mucous membranes basically you have to protect. Uh, do you also recommend people wearing two gloves? Would that be helpful if they were um, putting them on and while they're removing it, they do it step by step? Yes, so if you know properly how to remove the first glove and then uh, without contaminating the glove underneath, then go for it. But if you are a little bit reluctant and you're not really sure, I will not recommend two gloves. The more you're gonna wear, the, you know, while removing those uh, things, you're gonna be at risk of self-contamination. Uh, one more question for the doctors. When they are, uh, done with taking their gloves and gowns off, uh, should they wash their hands with soap before they touch the gown and the glasses or they can take them off without washing their hands with soap? 
No, they have to wash their hand every time they're touching uh, their face. Or anything their, on their face, okay. Anything on their face or uh, any gown, they have to wash hands 20 seconds with the soap. Another thing, do not fall into the trick of commercial media saying antibacterial soap, antiviral soap, all soaps are antibacterial and antiviral. And uh, the alcohol-based gel hand sanitizer only in cases where you cannot carry your soap, but there is, you know, no possibility of water close yeah. by. So I've seen some uh, times when I was uh, taking care of a patient with COVID-19, they gave me a uh, glasses or a shield that I was uh, taking my glasses off. I was wearing that, but I was wiping that at the end of my uh, room uh, visit with the patient. Uh, and I was wiping it with a Clorox type of wipe. Is that a good practice? Yes, you can use whatever antiseptic technique you can easily get access to. Every single room, these goggles are reusable, mean like you have to clean before going into another patient room every time you have rather than you know throwing them off because of shortage of PPE we have to be stingy about keeping those PPEs as much as we can um, yeah one question I have is if, as if I'm coming out of one patient who was COVID positive and I'm wearing all of these gowns, uh, two masks, uh, my N95 is closer to my nose and mouth. And then I, on the top of it, I have a surgical mask and I have my goggles. When I come out of that room, I have two sets of gloves. I take that off. Can I use the same thing and put another glove and go to another room or do I need to change it in between? Um, what, what is ideal? Uh, the ideal would be remove the gloves and then change the whole set of gloves and okay. wash your hand in between with the soap 20 seconds. Just don't give this virus a little bit, tiny bit chance to contaminate. Okay. So washing hands. Is it, is it okay to wash with regular temperature water or it has to be warm water? Uh, there is no such study you can uh, wash. You can with, wash it with even yeah, regular water. tap water yeah, that's coming out. Okay. You have to do full 20 seconds in between the fingers and tips and then back of the hand and up here. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's say if anyone has, a, has exposed them by yes. mistake. Let's say I came out of the room and I touched my face by mistake uh, and I forgot it. What can I do at that time? Should I just wash my face with soap? Just that wash is your face uh, with the soap. But again, you have to, if you are exposed to a person you know confirmed positive, you have to take all the precautions like, you know, self-monitoring 14 days. These days, uh, we are not putting in strict quarantine all the healthcare providers because there's a shortage of healthcare physicians. So we let them work, but with the monitoring, like they okay. have their temperature twice a day. They have to uh, watch for the symptoms, fatigue, loss of appetite, you know, loss of smell, taste, or uh, fever, monitoring. Dr. Nagra, I want to ask you uh, two more questions uh, for the physicians. I've heard a case where a physician um, actually was asymptomatic, but uh, unfortunately, he transferred it to his family member. Uh, what can we do as physicians when we come home to protect our families? So what I do, I can give you my own example, which, uh, you know, I think we are infectious disease we are dealing with not other viruses which are not as contagious but they are contagious so you have to uh, you know remove your scrubs or whatever you know gown or your coat in the garage and, and make sure you have another set of clothes over there in the garage before entering into the house and then just wash your hand in between. My garage is right in, you know, adjacent to my small laundry, which has the sink and the soap. I come inside, I just, you know, clean the door handles and then wash my hand 20 seconds and then I'll make sure your shoes are outside the door, not inside. And uh, these all, these are the things. Basic, that, all, all those basic things. And Do then, we yeah. Go ahead. So then I uh, come into my room, I take a shower, then I change again my clothes, and then I come into the family room. Okay. Uh, if 
I am um, taking care of a patient uh, uh, who are COVID positive. Do I need to wear a mask at my home or uh, it's not uh, necessary okay. until I don't have symptoms? Okay, very good question because COVID-19 can be spread through asymptomatic spreader, meaning like the doctor got exposed to COVID-19 positive patient and you are not very sure whether you know you got exposure or not or you might be exposed and you're not feeling sick does not mean that you cannot have COVID-19. So the maximum, um, the time period where you can spread virus to um, a healthy person is five to eight hours before the first symptom. Five to eight hours before onset of first symptom. Okay. So that is the maximum peak where you can spread maximum virus to the other person. Wow. So it's a, it's better and safer for you to keep wearing masks. It's not to protect yourself to prevent the spread to the other household members. Okay, thank you so much. So at the time of the day when you feel like you might have gotten exposed, maybe that evening, continue to isolate yourself maybe and also wearing a mask for that period of time. Um, yeah. Doctors, should they be getting tested for uh, antibodies? Would that help us at all? Because uh, some of my hospital oh, in, in America yes. are offering that and in, in other countries too. Yes, so antibodies, IgG, IgM. IgM usually start showing up in the blood. A lot of research studies and other viruses, knowledge from the other viruses when we know five to seven days after the onset of first symptom, you will start building IgM. And after two weeks of the symptom, you will start making IgG and the higher level you will see between uh, seven to 50 days of your onset of symptom, IgG will be the higher level titer. So uh, whether it's useful for us to test ourselves, honestly, I can tell you again my example that I do test myself once a month, IgG, IgM. I have one colleague who is an intensive care uh, specialist, ICU guy. He uh, did not get sick or anything, but he was checking himself once a month. And surprisingly, a week ago, he called me. He said that my IgG level is positive and it's very high, but I never got sick. But I was taking care of ICU patients. So I think it's helpful that, you know, peace of mind that you already got some kind of protection. Uh, and another thing uh, that is debatable, PCR, RT-PCR um, is positive even fifth week after the resolution of symptoms. Lots of phone calls I received from small community hospitals. So there is no confirmed data. If your PCR is positive, you are still infectious, like your level of you know, viral spreading is still there. Because just an example, C. diff colitis, you know, C. diff toxin G, B gene PCR, if it is positive, patient is asymptomatic, I do not consider that patient to be infectious. PCR is just a gene which can be a dead virus, you know, it's just the sequencing of the gene. So um, what I do, if you have symptom resolution two weeks after the last symptom, I think it's okay for a patient to go and do their job, you know, there'll be very low risk for spread of the virus, even if your PCR is positive. And for healthcare providers, I've heard somewhere they said three days post your last symptom of fever or cough, you could go back to work if your yeah. uh, healthcare uh, system needs you. For us, there is very different criteria. Yeah, for, for patients. It varies from every uh, hospital to hospital infectious disease protocol. So what we do for physicians is different from what we do for the other non-healthcare providers. If they call us, they want to go back to work, a job, then I always wait two weeks safely. Since we are recording this topic purely for physicians, this video, I would like to ask you uh, any comments uh, about uh, remdesivir, if you would like to share something. So remdesivir, again, there is no confirmed data yet, except a small study that showed that there is 31% um, you know, success rate if you use remdesivir in critically sick patient. There is no data about mild to moderately ill patient. And this is uh, the drug which is broad spectrum antiviral and it inhibits RNA, um, messenger RNA uh, 
uh, you know, replication. And the other detail about mode of action is not very well known. So whatever studies out there is not very impressive for us to base 100% our success leading to like severe. So, but at this point in time, whatever you have available out there, just try everything possible, severe. Then um, I would think azithromycin is better than hydroxychloroquine. Do not try to combine these two drugs. I have seen so many practical cases with QT prolongation arrhythmias and old people. Uh, there's certain death. They did not wake up in the morning that I assume maybe it's arrhythmia that, you know, killed the patient. So uh, without monitoring, do not use combination of azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine. Remdesivir is safe to use in the hospital. It's IV anyway. You cannot get it at home. That's a good point here. And um, then again, once patient is in ICU, you know, it's um, just cover for superimposed bacterial infection, give IV hydration, symptomatic treatment, and then um, IL-6 inhibitor, they are also proven to be helpful, not 100% BD. So the drawback is once you're going to give tocilizumab, those uh, IL-6 inhibitor, they'll calm you down, they'll calm all the cytokine storm, but then you will be at risk of superimposed bacterial pneumonias and bacterial infection. Then make sure patient is well covered with all broad spectrum antibiotic and even antifungal. Thank you. Thank you so much. These are really good points uh, to think about. I uh, would conclude our session uh, with uh, uh, COVID-19 updates for physicians. Uh, thank you so much.